everybody. It's me, John Ward, and I am back with another One Filmmaker, One Film. But this is not One Filmmaker, One Film. This is One Composer, Many Soundtracks, or One Soundtrack, or One Score. <laughs> we're, we're talking about many things uh, here today, and um, I am very happy to have on my guest. And introduce yourself, please. Hi, my name is Matt Cannon. I'm a filmmaker, uh, composer. Uh, I've been doing uh, short films uh, for almost, I think, like maybe a couple years. And <laughs> I've only had two under my belt, but I've done a lot more <laughs> scores than that. So I guess I consider myself more of a composer than a filmmaker. But thank you so much, John. It's great to be here. Oh, well, thank you for being on here. I'm, I'm very happy about that. So it's, uh, and I own um, several of the movies that you've worked on. I own two of the soundtracks and um, you have some other stuff that's up on uh, Bandcamp that people can yep. listen to. So I'm going to put all those links in the description down below so people can listen to your stuff and purchase your stuff um, either through, you know, you can get it digitally or you can get it uh, physically. So, um, cause I have both. And, uh, so what we're going to start off with here and we'll let, we'll let everybody watching know is we're going to divide this in half. We're going to do like half film, half soundtrack, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Matt's made some, some good short films and I definitely want to focus on those. Yeah. One of them, I'm, uh, I like both films and, uh, but one of them I'm more, I, I don't want to say more impressed with cause I like them both, but I, I guess I was. I don't know exactly how to put it. I guess I was just impressed that there's no dialogue in it and it's mm -hmm. all music and you were able to tell a total story without dialogue. Kind of like a silent yeah. film in a way. Yeah, um, very much so. Yeah. But even in silent films, there were subtitles. So, and, and you didn't even have subtitles in this. So the, the no. first one that I like to talk about is Hexercise. And uh, like I said, there's sure. no dialogue. It's all music. And um, it's a it's interesting because it's you're very eighties. I've noticed um, a lot of yeah. your soundtracks have an eighties feel to them. Uh, your shorts kind of have this eighties feel to them. Um, so before we get into the film, why why eighties? What has kind of made you gravitate towards these eighties like shorts and and soundtracks? I grew up in the eighties. Um, I mean pretty much the best answer I could give. I mean, I just had all that in me. I mean, I grew up in my later years in the 90s, but being born in 83, I was exposed to all of that stuff. And um, I mean, in my later years, I started discovering these things a lot more kind of going back. And um, I just find 80s music to be something really interesting. And of course, nostalgic. And that's really probably the biggest reason why I do it. It's just, there's something different emotionally with 80s music than there is with you know uh, contemporary or 90s you know that's just I think that makes sense to me yeah and it just it hit me like I guess in a, in a way where I like doing it I like listening to it so yeah I think that's the answer for that yeah what uh, <laughs> what yeah. composers and uh like soundtracks have influenced you the the most then um of course John Carpenter uh, oh. Halloween 3, um, the Prince of Darkness score, both of those scores are just phenomenal. Um, uh, I think The Shining, Walter, Wendy, Carlos, um, uh, a lot of that, you know, just even that, that was, I guess it's kind of like 70s maybe, but like, I am, there's so many, man. It's really just such a hard question. It's like, what's your favorite movie in a way? But <laughs> I mean, I think other ones that kind of, I think Beyond the Black Rainbow was a real, even though that was kind of made around, you know, this time, um, that kind of really made me sort of think about doing the score work a little bit more seriously when it was coming more into, I, I wouldn't say the mainstream, but it was something that um, it was becoming a little bit more uh, knowing now, like it was getting out there a little bit more, but that was the score that really kind of made me think about wanting to do score work but not completely seriously there was um you know i i think it was killing spree uh john uh tim reader's killing spree is probably the biggest inspiration for making me want to do actual film scoring but um yeah i think like i said john carpenter 
Prince of Darkness, Halloween 3. Those are two of the big ones that got me influenced. I, I've become, when I first saw Prince of Darkness, I was not a huge fan of it. And, uh, you know, of course I collect all of his scores, you know, all of John Carpenter's scores. I have multiple versions of them. Uh, That's you awesome. Know, yeah, I have like the regular score. Then I have like the extended score. Then I have, I mean, it's like, the, I normally have like three different versions of each film that oh he's my done. God. And oh uh, so, God. yeah, I, I probably have something like, 30 different soundtracks from him and uh halloween 3 is definitely one that stands out um i yeah. think out of all the halloween soundtracks um it's probably the one for me that stands out the most um yeah so that one was really good and then over time prince of darkness um i've started to really enjoy as a film always liked the soundtrack for that um yeah but once people started calling it like part of his apocalypse trilogy Boom, instantly right. I became a huge fan of it um, and I rewatched <laughs> it. And now I love the film. I think it's one of his best movies and one of his best scores. Yeah. So um, uh, what other films do you think from the, you know, from that time period? Not Carpenter, it doesn't even have to be horror. Is there any other like films that uh, you can remember that really kind of impressed you with their, their soundtrack or just the film itself? Um, Man, it's tough. There's, I mean, I guess, like, like there was maybe some comedies like Terry Gilliam movies like Brazil was a big one I really liked a lot. Um, man, it's so hard because it's, it's, it horror films pretty much have dominated what I do. So it's so hard to kind of veer off of it. But um, I don't know if I could answer that. It's a tough one, man. Um, I really don't know. I should have wrote these answers down, man. <laughs> it's, there's, the, the thing with influences come and go with different projects I, I do. So it's always like I'm fishing from different, different kind of movies and they can be movies from the nineties. Um, there's movies in, in the nineties that inspire me to do 80s soundtracks. But like, like I said, it's probably more horror films like, oh, man, it's so hard to think about because there's so many. Are there mm -hmm. any films or soundtracks that you thought just did not match? Like a, 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 a Roger Ebert has said, and, and he won't take it back. He goes, the soundtrack for The Graduate was wrong. Simon okay. Garfunkel did not fit that movie. He's like, and he never, he, up to his, you know, up until when he died, he would not say, okay, I guess I was wrong. Um, he's right. kind of hinted at it, like, well, I don't know, maybe, you know, in retrospect, <laughs> but he's never just come out to say that soundtrack did not match the film, which it does. I mean, it's my all time favorite movie. It's a great soundtrack. Simon and Garfunkel are awesome. Um, is there anything like that that comes to mind where you've watched a film and, and this could be of yeah. any time period and you've gone, that so, score does not match. No, I'm glad you said it because it just jolted something for me. So um, Alvin or Alan Silvestri, I think that's his name, who did music for Back to the Future. Yes. A um, bunch of different films. Um, he did the music for the movie Flight of the Navigator. It is an incredible film. It's one of my top five favorite kids fantasy movies. Um, the music for that, I'm in love with the music for it because it's so just energetic Um uplifting in a way but for some odd reason there's certain parts of the score that just i guess don't completely go with it which is more the upbeat stuff the more like orchestral stuff makes sense to me but like when you start getting to like the more upbeat stuff it, it just it it didn't go well with it but the weird part is i still liked it i mean it's just you know they're just i i almost could see that upbeat music in like a workout video or like a um like a 1980s instructional video on how to like uh, work in a supermarket or something like that, or <laughs> something in that kind of realm. It just didn't seem to kind of mesh with the film, but um, as crazy as it is, every time I hear that music, I think of the movie. So I guess they did something right, but just for me, like personally, I, I don't know if I could see it in that movie. Yeah, I think I, I haven't seen Flight of the Navigator in decades. Uh, so I'll have to uh, yeah. listen to the soundtrack for that. And uh, it's a Disney film, isn't it? it? It is. It is. I think they released it in UK under, uh, under I think, uh, some, some other company. But it was Disney here. And I think might have been like Vestron or, or 
something something like that. I think Vestron's right. Yeah, yeah, I remember that yeah. the like the the yeah. VHS tape of it. I think said Vestron on the side. Yeah, but they used to do a lot of different um, tape. Like companies would would either sell their movies to other companies, or they would have deals where like like I think it was. Um, I know Vestron did a lot of stuff with like I think uh, Little Monsters was originally released was supposed to be on Vestron and they went bankrupt around that time and and went on to MGM but I still think it got released to Vestron in the UK I could be wrong I mean but I think there's a lot of that going on in the 80s yeah for sure the, yeah the, I can't off the top of my head I can't think of anything that that was really where I just went oh god that doesn't match I mostly find <laughs> it more with independent or micro budget films where people okay. grab like a royalty free music from YouTube and, oh, and yeah. it's yeah. like maybe they listen to like the first like 30 seconds and they're like oh this matches and then they put it in their film or their trailer and it, like it doesn't match at all it's like maybe <laughs> the first 30 40 seconds was good and like why is this in this movie did the filmmaker not actually listen to this music because now it just sounds totally different. Like, why is this even here? Um, right. But I guess, well, you got it for free. So <laughs> might as well like throw look, it in there. Like, I don't know if you think about the idea of contrast and content with like certain movies, like look at Magnolia, like the soundtrack to Magnolia is completely like a a pop soundtrack with like all this darkness going into it. Right. You know, it's, it's like... It's a perspective thing too, I think, because that that plays a lot into a lot of films with contrast and content. And I mean, it, people be surprised how much that happens in movies and how much you can go, oh, well, that doesn't go with the movie at all. When in fact, it actually might strengthen the film to some extent. Okay. Okay. Good way to look at it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But um, I totally get what you know. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of a weird thing. I mean, I think I I might have even done that on some of my stuff where I've grabbed that royalty sure. free stuff, and uh, it's like, oh, it kind of works. But with that, yeah, that's that's <laughs> iffy. I mean, I I had people who have told me like they wanted me to score movies because they're tired of using royalty free tracks, and I'm like that sounds great. You should be using them. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like, uh, yeah. Can you make the? Can you make it sound like this royalty free music? <laughs> I've never heard that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, instead of saying I want it to sound like John Carpenter's The Thing, you know, or something, yeah. or Escape from New York, can you make it sound like this royalty free music I found on YouTube? Yeah. Why not just use the royalty free music? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen someone's trailer for a movie not too long ago that um, was very similar 80s, dark wave, synth wave. And I'm like, oh man, who is this? And I wrote to the filmmaker, I'm like, Yo, who is that composer in your movie doing a trailer? He's like, oh, that's royalty free. Like, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I'll never know. Yeah, it's 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 weird, but it, it's it's kind of yeah. fun to kind of figure out th this music because it's uh, when when I made Meadow Massacre four, Dustin Ferguson edited the trailer for that, and we did go on to YouTube and grab royalty free music, so we found something that we thought would match that type of movie, like a Texas Chainsaw type film. And so mm. in my trailer is this kind of music that's like wah, wah, wah throughout it. You know, it yeah. sounds like Inception or some of these other, you know, right. scores. And yeah. now I'm constantly hearing that music in films <laughs> and trailers. And it's like, oh, people went to the same place I did. They just went to YouTube and, and found this kind of, you know, wah type music. And now it's in the movie, like when there's a chase scene yeah. or it's in their trailer. And it's like, okay, well, we mm -hmm. thought we were being original, but I guess not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's what it's there for people to grab. But like, it's like how many people are actually grabbing the thing I'm grabbing to use. And then <laughs> it just spirals out from there. Yeah, it's funny. So, all righty. Yeah, so great. now, now we know a little bit about you and 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 soundtracks and stuff. Let's get to a movie. <laughs> so, um, sure. so Hexercise. Um, it's a short film. It's eighteen minutes. Um, this is uh, why Hexercise. What uh, what brought you to wanting to make this movie? Um, my shortest answer or long answer? <laughs> How, whatever you want to say. It's your I'm, interview. <laughs> um. I mean, 
at the time I, I actually was, I was injured. I had an on the job injury that put me um, out of work. I didn't even know how long it was going to be. The doctor told me it could be a few months. Um, and I ended up, you know, just kind of hanging at home, not knowing what to do. And at the time I just started doing uh, a little bit of score work. Um, I was working on a friend's movie and um, I was doing sort of like, like I was saying something earlier about like 80s supermarket video music. Um, he, a friend of mine, uh, a friend who was the filmmaker making this movie, he sent me a clip to kind of get inspiration from. And um, from then I, I kind of took the sound. I was like, that's interesting. I kind of like that. I never tried playing this style of music, but um, I started playing it. Um, it was really fun. But then I started thinking, well, what if I added like a horror edge to it? And so I started combining this sort of like, I almost would say the music in this video he sent me reminded me of like workout tunes. So I said, what if I took that with horror and just kind of meshed them together and, and see what would happen? And um, I started thinking, hey, why don't I make like a concept album out of this if I come up with a couple of songs and then I could release it on a VHS or something and make like a bunch of like music videos. <laughs> and the idea I had was going to be a um, kind of like a Richard Simmons workout video. And each song would be people being pulled out and being killed by some mass murder and, you know, in different ways. So each song would be like a different killing. Um, and then I don't know what it was, but I decided, no, I didn't want to do that. And it just kind of, it, it sort of just developed on its own, like in rewrites um that maybe i can actually do like a narrative feature and you know maybe we don't i don't have to write any dialogue for it i'll just kind of have people do things with body language and um yeah so it kind of like developed with a collaboration too with a friend of mine after i i wrote to him with maybe some help on the uh story itself and he eventually gave me some good ideas and we just kind of collaborated on it and uh that's what it came to today yeah, to be exercised. So it developed kind of just like bit by bit over time. But so yeah. it's a um, it's it's uh, for people who haven't seen it. It's um, it, it's very 80s. Um, it takes place in a gym. Um, and so it, it's kind of like uh, in a way, what is it? Killer Workout is one of them. Yeah, Th there were two oh, of them. Oh, made. Uh, oh yeah. Killer Workout one. Death Spa. That's, that's, yes, was, that's the one I'm trying to think of. Yeah. And so yeah. you got the people, of course. Um, it starts in 1969, and um, it starts with a uh, like a cult. And the one thing that I liked about this was the um, – I don't want to give too much away on the stuff, so I'm going to try to stay spoiler-free. But um, once that little segment is over in 1969, the camera does cut to – uh, a record and on it it says um i shall return in blood and i like that i thought that was funny i thought that was a clever way of doing <laughs> it and uh because it's did this have anything to do with if you remember back in the day you know if you listen to a judas priest album backwards you would commit suicide because <laughs> this seems to play um, through a lot through music a lot it is the you know it's it's a uh, it's a it's a boom box that yeah. gets possessed so uh did any of that type of thing, like back in the day with Tipper Gore and all that, did any of that play into this? Um, I don't, I don't think so. But it's a really cool idea. I wish I would have <laughs> said that back in the day, because, um, well, it's funny because so uh, there is another movie that inspired that, which was um, Evil Speak. Oh, that's a good uh, one. Yeah, where where Esteban uh, says in the computer screen, like, um, "I will return. I shall return." And I always kind of liked that. In fact, the, the cult leader character is sort of based off of the Esteban character in Evil Speak. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think I've ever, that's a really, man, John, that's a really cool idea. Really, <laughs> that's, so, but I mean, I love that kind of like um, lore, like that sort of like the gate kind of thing, you know, or trick or treat where like you play the record backwards and, or like the hidden message. But, yeah, but the whole boombox thing, um, well, it got scaled down because originally it was supposed to be like, this is going to be some really good. Have you ever watched Kids in the Hall before? Yes. 
the the devil character that they have on the show um that's played by i think um scott thompson or i'm i think it's mark mckinney i think plays him and he plays the devil and i was thinking man we should have like a devil character like mark mckinney's character but like really grossed out looking kind of just like amped up the 10 and he has a boom box with him like this like cool looking devil dude who just walks around the gym with like the boom box and it shoots out like tape reels and like chokes people and turns her face and like melts it or whatever but um i had to scale that back because it was just something i couldn't even do at the time so i said let's just have the boom box be possessed and that would be pretty interesting if, if anything pretty original so we went with that idea it is original because you can also have um which they do different characters bring the boom box from room to room and then yeah. that way it can, you know, uh, attack people instead of something like Evil Speak, which I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, yeah. best thing Clint Howard ever did. Well, except for Star oh, totally. Trek, you know, with a trend, or, yeah, or you know, that's, yes. Uh, and, and of course, <laughs> Apollo 13, he was good in too. But yes. uh, in Evil Speak, that's true. <laughs> um, Evil Speak, he's, it's a stationary just computer because this is what, right. 1980? So of course they're not going to have you know laptops and everything so the boom box is really clever because it goes from location to location and nobody knows right. that it's possessed so and, and of course right. it uh it's funny because it, it's it sits there somebody hits play and then that's when the smoke comes in the red light comes <laughs> in and then kind of what's ever in that area kills a person right. and uh you you do some clever stuff. So I, I like like at the beginning of it when we meet um, the gym manager or the boss, uh, he's standing. You, you see in the background, it's all like kind of like palm trees and everything. So you think he's on location, and and it the camera pulls back and all it is is just wallpaper as he sits at his desk. And so I thought that that was clever. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Zoom. I'm really glad to see that the uh, update for uh, having freezing uh, stopped worked. Uh, we just completely got kicked off. And, uh, <laughs> but hey, that's, uh, you know, we fixed in editing, I guess. So, uh, but uh, Matt, what, um, you know, what did you think of uh, uh, that scene that I had mentioned with the, the manager and the camera pulls back and it reveals that he's in his office, not in Hawaii? Um, I thought it was funny. I thought it was a great thing. <laughs> Hence why it's uh, in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it was just, I I mean, it was the wallpaper. I, I just didn't know people would actually think it's Hawaii in general. I thought it was just going to be wallpaper. But if it convinced you that it was Hawaii, that's awesome. Because we're better <laughs> from than we actually thought. Yeah, I, I uh, thought I thought it was done well. So it's thank uh, you. you. You have some funny things in there that I like. Like there's um after there's like a murder or two, there's like a there's like a really short cop, and then there's two taller women, you know, on like yeah. either like bookending him. I thought that was funny. Um, uh, um so there's clever yeah. little things like that in it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the cop, I think we um were you talking about the guy who was uh, talking to two girls or the two cops exchanging dialogue with each other uh the one cop talking to the two taller girls okay yeah he was um who's actually sitting down <laughs> but <laughs> i love that that's that's even better i'm gonna tell carrie that that was said he'll probably think he'll probably get a kick out of it man yeah that was uh um just little things like that you know it, it's the little details <laughs> that matter that when you because you could have you could have just had them all at the same height but why? Yeah. why? Why would you do that? You know, it's just, yeah, make, make him yeah. smaller. You know, keep the girls tall and make him smaller. So that that oh. seems to be, uh, uh, I think, the way to go. And it worked. Um, another thing I liked in it is that you did not overdo the 80s stuff in it. A lot of people right. were just wall-to-wall -wall 80s. And, okay, I, I'm, you know, I'm 54. I lived through the 80s. So when a lot of younger like filmmakers want to show the 80s in their films, they just slam pack everything in there. And it's like, that's not right. what it was like. I mean, life yeah. is normal in the 80s. 
I mean, it's no more different than it is today. We just had different posters and clothing, but it was right. never wall to wall. You know, just look at Fast Times at Ridgemont High or one of those films if you want to, an example of what yeah. the 80s look like. So I, I do appreciate you not just flooding it with 80s stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of hard to really do do that anyway. I mean, we were, our locations that we used, um, we actually used a an 80s themed escape room for most oh. of like the, uh, yeah, like a lot of the scenes where they're working out and we shot it in an escape room in, in uh, Philadelphia. And um, it was actually a lot of stuff in there was pretty 80s, but the fact that we shot on like single color walls, it added like almost a sort of like other dimensional kind of feel to it that like, um, yeah, I think the costumes were, was probably the only indication, but we didn't really, I mean, I guess if we wanted to make it more 80s, we probably could have like with hair uh, styles and all that, but, um, and makeup and, you know, but I mean, with dealing with what we were given, we just kind of worked with what we got. Yeah, and, and, and it looked good. So it's, uh, oh, another, you. oh, you're welcome. Yeah, another thing that cracked me up is when the, uh, the detective, uh, when he goes in to talk to the boss and he just has a box that's labeled cult investigations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like just everything is thrown into this one box that deals with cults, you know? It's, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> he like works for the X-Files. It's like that section in the building where like nobody goes to it has cobwebs all over it. Yeah, it's like, oh, okay, well, we've had three cult murders. I just throw it in the box that just says cult yeah. investigations. <laughs> so that cracked me up. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and there's little, and now I'm guessing because of your, your soundtrack experience, there, there's also some sound um, stuff that you paid attention to. Like uh, there's a scene where the music's going and then it cuts to a TV and it, and it has that TV sound for the soundtrack. And then it cuts back to like the regular sounding soundtrack. I believe one of the people once again pushes on the, the play button. So I said, it, it's all in the little details where you just could have just had the soundtrack run through the whole thing and not bother with it. But you know, there's a right. TV there. Let's give it the TV sound. Yeah, I mean, it was something kind of the last minute I thought of, like, I think it just felt, it felt right. I've never done anything like that before. Kind of, um, I, I'm not sure if the word's non-diegetic or sound. The sound is actually, it, it's playing in the scene. Um, <laughs> but I think it was it was just interesting to try and do it that way. I mean, it felt like um, it just felt like it, it it worked. Like it wasn't me really trying to be clever or trying to think of something that like, oh, this will catch your attention. But like, I think I had to figure something out to. I don't know. I guess it was clever, but it's something to make it seem <laughs> something to make it seem interesting in the scene and um, kind of catch someone's attention a little bit that you know um but the music does i should have done it through other parts in the movie but it just felt like that part kind of made sense to me to do it in sure and and it's nice because um like back in the day when i was in college i made a 16 millimeter film called burtonstein where we took a burt doll and turned it into the frankenstein monster and it starts <laughs> attacking cool. people and <laughs> the soundtrack cool. was lost and I just can't find it, but I have the film and uh, on digital. So what I did when I originally put it up on YouTube is I just took a piece of music and just ran it through. You know, I didn't even bother. I, I think okay. I could have added some lightning. I probably could have in the lab added some electricity sounds. I didn't. I was lazy and, and just found a piece of music and just had it run all the way through. So it, it's oh, nice man. to see that you paid attention to that type of thing where I was lazy. You weren't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I would love to see that movie, by the way. That sounds great. Oh, well, thanks. Well, it will go up on YouTube again. Um, unfortunately, the music that I put on there, I guess, is even though the film has never made a dime, it's never seen really the light of day except for YouTube, YouTube still canceled it and went, hey, that's you can't use that music. It's copyrighted and, and right. shut me down. Right. So it's just like, well, son of a bitch. Nobody's making money off of this thing. Who cares? But I, I guess it was. So I got to just find some royalty-free music on YouTube uh, to throw you can, on there. You can ask me. I'll throw you some oh, music. There you go. There you go. I, I appreciate yeah. that. And, and, I, and I most likely will. I mean, yeah. I mean, that sounds like a good idea. So it's a fun little film. It's, I don't know, 10, 12 minutes, something like that. But, it sounds uh, great, though. It really sounds fun. 
Well, I'll send it to you and, and see what you can do Please. with it. I'd appreciate it. So yeah, Please. I'd love to have your love to have your work on it. So um and let's see, okay. what else do I have on here? Da, 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 da. Lots of desks. You have you have lots of inventive desks, one by VHS tape, another one done by yeah. weights. Um yeah. you have now the one thing, the there's a creature in this that's kind of like a mouth and like a hand comes out of that. Uh -huh. What what is the creature? What is that thing? Is is that like the devil or what what is that? <laughs> um, it looks cool. So I guess I'm not allowed to curse here because I was just gonna say <laughs> a curse for going out. Um because it, it it's an awesome little thing that we want we had an idea for it. It was gonna be it's it's a punching bag. So it's really a punching oh. bag that comes to life. Um in the back of the um the gym manager, you actually can see it hanging there, but it was our our mistake that we didn't really establish um set or set up the actual punching bag earlier. So um it kind of caused a little confusion, but um people still thought it was insane. We've had people tell us it's like some sort of Cronenbergian kind of monster yeah. because of course it looks <laughs> like a vagina. So I, I thought that was hilarious, but like um yeah it's just it's supposed to be a punching bag come to life my so my effects guy um eric welsh he made the actual punching bag and me and my wife kind of like cut actually my wife cut it open and she put all the, the fake teeth and stuff inside of it and uh it was a bitch um <laughs> to get together it really was but i'm glad you really liked it it was definitely a weird creature and a thing coming out of the mouth it was originally supposed to be like um, a punching glove comes out of it. I mean, I, I wasn't thinking, now I'm thinking it would have been like killer clowns, like with the punching glove and punches the dude's head off, right. except it punches through his the, his back and it comes out like, you know, you've seen the movie. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I have a couple times. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's interesting looking. Um, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was a little confused. Yeah, because I didn't get that it was a, um, like a punching bag. But now when totally. you say it, it does make sense yeah. since it's, it would be, yeah, this way. And then you have the mouth and then you got the teeth yeah. and it's opening. Yeah. So yeah, so that, that makes sense now, but it's cool looking. It, it, it yeah. almost has kind of a Lovecraftian, I think, kind of like a cosmic horror oh. type of feel to it. Um, I think that. Awesome. Yeah. So it, it's, you. it's. It's interesting looking. So it's, um, but now when, when people watch this and then they see the film, they'll know that it's a, a punching bag. So. Yeah, it's it's really something that me and my wife were talking about. Like we should just shoot, like make another one and just establish it somewhere in the movie and just splice it in. But I don't even know if it's even worth it at this point. I mean, the movie is what it is and I just feel like leaving it alone. So, but let your imagination run wild. That's yeah. what I'll say. Well, and, and you got to move on, you know, you can't, uh, you you can't move on. keep just adding and adding and re-editing and re-editing yes. and, and I've, yes. I've fallen under that, that curse. So, yeah, that, so just got to move on. And uh, totally. Totally. Uh, like many 80s films, will there be a sequel to this? I don't want to give away the ending, but uh, I don't, I don't think so. No, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I mean, we, I've had someone actually talk to me about doing a full length version of the film oh. and um it really was it's so it, it just put it this way it was it was a very stressful movie to make it was my first one i really did i did a short film in college but that was just me and a friend this was just like with 14 people and um total strangers and it was really just so much going on in the film um if I did it again, it would have to be something that if I did actually do a sequel or a full length, I would have to be like mentally prepared for it. And um, I mean, short answer, probably not. <laughs> I do apologize. I love the movie to death. Don't get me wrong. It's it's just it is what it is. I'd rather just like leave it, let history do the rest. What, would you uh how about letting someone else do it i mean there's definitely enough of uh, i mean we know all these people on facebook and stuff that love 80s type stuff you know if somebody were to say hey i would love to do a part two would you let them do it or is it just kind of eh? i'm just gonna move on i don't know it's not a bad idea if i wrote a script and somebody wanted to do it um 
sure i mean that i mean that would be cool it's just it's um i guess i mean it would take me out of the equation of directing um i love directing but it, it can be i can be so stressful and i get so super self-conscious doing it so like having somebody else do it might be better for me <laughs> anyway so, <laughs> that's a good possibility though I, I i think that would be great john now you said that you you know if you wrote it do you are do you have an idea for a sequel no but i mean it definitely would at least continue uh, maybe it would probably have to be something more like maybe in the 90s or something like that uh, maybe it could okay. be yeah like more into a 90s atmosphere and if we did a third movie it would go into like uh the 2000s oh Spice okay Girl, all, <laughs> all that kind of stuff so see the, so, the wheels are turning a little you know just a little bit there you know <laughs> you, you started the engine man there you go. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm glad about that. Um, now, as as I just thought, and I wrote down here, um, just uh, that you produced, you wrote, and you directed the film. But according to the end credits, um, you are one of the cult leaders. You were the editor. Um, the titles were you. Um, the music is you. Additional effects are you. So is, is that all correct? <laughs> um Pretty much. Uh, additional effects, I would say I, I helped my wife. Uh, she's the one who did a lot of the, um, her and Eric, they collaborated together to do most of the effects, uh, if not all of them. I only kind of was just supervising and I made, I did some of the things like the blood um, getting sucked into the floor kind of thing, um, some of the blood drips. So I think that probably the only thing that I would say I'm not as much into, but I think additional probably makes sense more than saying I'm an actual effects artist on the film, but editing. Yes, I have. I did all the editing. All the titles were me. Um, all the music was me. Um, most of the writing was me besides um, a friend of mine um, who actually was my AD on the film, Quinn, Quinn Arlington Waters, um, who helped me out do a little bit of the extra writing. Um, so most of it is like score directing, um, editing is, and I guess m the writing mostly would be me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, special thanks to Todd Sheets and Linnea Quigley. Yeah. So uh, um, why are, why are they thanked? Uh, well, I worked with Todd Sheets for a little bit uh, before I got to make this movie, and just. He's a person who's an influence from just, you know, talking to me, <laughs> helping me out with other film, like, just like inspirational stuff. And Lene Quigley, um, so I guess because like Horror Workout was a movie that I did watch too, maybe it was unmentioned, but that was another inspiration, Lene Quigley's Horror Workout. Um, and I remember meeting her and telling her about her movie and she seemed interested and, and thought it was very cool that we are making a movie kind of... In, loosely inspired from uh, said film. So, but uh, yeah, there's another movie that inspired exercise as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. And so, yeah. yeah. And has, um, has exercise been on anything? Like, is it on a, like an anthology? Is it, you know, where can people see it? Um, right now it's just available through me. Um, I'm making multiple copies. It's not, it used to be on, um, avail TV, but for some odd reason, their service has been disabled or they're not doing much on there right now. So, um, it's unfortunately just through me, it's not on any streaming service. We're trying to get it sent to some people right now. I really don't know where it's going to be. It's not on any anthologies. So, I mean, um, in the near future, you probably can do it streaming, but right now you can contact me on Facebook and I can, you know, send it to you guys if anybody wants a copy. I have, I'm making tapes and getting new DVDs and at some point, so we're going to have like a whole, a whole new um, like DVD thing of it at some point down the road. Nice. Okay, good. Good. Yeah, yeah I, I look forward to that. So especially if it's like a physical copy, because I'm more, yeah, I'm more physical than digital. So it's weird. For some reason, I prefer my films to be physical, but my music can be digital. That's okay. I, I don't know. Fine. Yeah, I, I like both being physical, but music yeah. just seems to make more sense. You know, being it, digital, I guess. It, yeah, I mean, like I have, 
I have tons of music, tons of music I listen to on YouTube or Spotify, but I have a, an immense amount of vinyl that I'll listen to too. But like, I think it's your preference. You know, if that's what you'd like to do. That's totally cool. Yeah. I mean, every, to each to each his own, man. I love it. I love it. I watch movies on, on, on streaming all the time. I have tons of VHS movies. I have tons of DVDs yet. I'll watch stuff anywhere. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm biased when it comes to that kind of stuff. I get a little mad at some of these companies like Netflix. They never seem to release their stuff. Um, you know, like you have to just watch it on Netflix. So when right. you're watching like the haunting of Hill house, it's like, Oh, okay. I can't own it. Even though I'm a huge Mike Flanagan fan, I want that copy to put next to his other movies. Oh, well, I guess I can't. Cobra Kai, same thing. I got the DVD from hmm. YouTube for seasons one and two, but they just won't release season three unless they're going to do season three and four together. But, you know, it, it's, and, and, and I hate to say it, it's almost like, you know, you kind of have to sail the high seas in some ways to, you know, to get these things. I mean, you hmm. almost have to do like a, you know, a torrent or something if you want to own certain movies because certain companies just won't release them. And, yeah, and it's like, like shows. yeah, yeah. It's, just, it, it's really yeah. unfortunate that they're, you know, that they're greedy that way. It's nice to yeah. know that something really big like Cobra Kai is not going to go anywhere. I mean, it will probably be on there forever, but still it's like, I don't know. I just like to own that physical copy of it. Like, didn't they put out Haunting of Hill House on DVD or am I crazy? I thought I saw Is that. it now? Maybe, maybe it is. I, maybe it's been long like, enough. I mean, I'll look it up because now, now I feel like I saw it in a Walmart or a Fye or something like that. But I, I could be wrong. If it is out, then that that gives me hope for them. So um, I looked a while back; I didn't see it. Uh, but um, yeah, I haven't looked for a while. So maybe now that the the second series is out, the Bly Manor, it's now available. Yeah. So. But did enough like about Mike Flanagan's films. Oh, I did like Bly Manor. Um, I loved. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, yeah. I loved Hill House. Um, I liked Blind Manor. Not as much. I wish Mike had, had directed all the episodes, but because um, he's my yeah. favorite director right now. Uh, but oh, yeah, I, I enjoyed both. So. so good. So good. Yeah, he, he's very talented. He's he's right now the one of the best Stephen King directors out there. So he's just very yeah. talented. Yeah, man, I agree with that. So, um, but like I said, enough yeah. about Matt Flanagan. Let, let's get on it's to fun. you because this is not about Mike Flanagan. As I now turn the page, we now go to Open House, which was the other short film that you sent me. Um, that's uh, uh, this year, 2021. It's 11 minutes. Um, it is part of, and I was way too lazy and concerned about COVID uh, to be part of this anthology, but uh, your Open House is part of Horror Tales 666 yeah. Part 2. Yeah. And so it's it's a... Other directors on that are like Phil Herman, Joe Sherlock. Uh, the producers on that are Phil Herman, Dustin Hubbard, Chris Woods, uh, uh, Joel D. Uh, Winecoop. Um, you looks like you do the music, so it, it's a uh, looks like it's going to be a pretty good uh, anthology. I'm I should be on part three, hopefully, uh, with cool. my short film awesome. Delete. And uh, just yeah. too lazy, just COVID kind of freaked me out for a while, so I, I wasn't doing anything unless I could record it right here in my apartment or by myself <laughs> outside. Um, so tell me about Open House. What inspired you to make Open House? Um, so I was delivering mail one day and it was around Halloween and um, I'm delivering to this cluster box and out of the corner of my eye, um, and this is like a couple of days before Halloween. So I'm, I'm kind of just feeding the mail, looking around other houses at the decorations. And out of the corner of my eye, it, corner of my eye, it looks like somebody's standing there dressed up in an outfit. Like, already I'm like, this is not even Halloween yet. And this dude's already like outside getting ready. <laughs> and I turn around to look and it's it's like a, just this, like a life-size witch decoration. And um, like he's like the standing like, like if someone was just standing there, person lifelike standing decorations they have, um, it just looked like it, like an actual person standing there. And it was just kind of weird because I thought, well, that's kind of strange. Like that would be an interesting idea for a movie. And at that time, Phil Herman was writing to me, asking me to do the, to, to be a part of the anthology. He was a big fan of exercise and he wanted me to be a part of it. I was not very, um, 
I was a little reluctant to actually do it. I just wasn't really sure about directing again. And um, so I said, you know what, I'll let you know in a couple of days. And I eventually I told him like, okay, yeah, man, I think I have a good idea for it. And then in between that, that's when I had my whole little meeting with that decoration thing. Um, and yeah, so that was the main inspiration was basically what if someone like, like a, like a mannequin or a decoration that comes to life kind of thing. That was like the biggest thing that kind of um, ignited the idea for, for what was going to be um, the rest of the film. So basically you yeah. took much inspiration from Mannequin 2 on the move. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mannequin's oh, actually, a, it's actually an okay movie. So I, I had to bring up Mannequin 2 dot 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 on the move <laughs> yeah i was talking to someone about that movie the other day and um he said that it's like one of his favorite sequels and that's amazing i actually don't remember mannequin 2 but i love love the first mannequin movie um i mean of course that has great music in it i think that made what was the song at the end of that movie that got like real big from it um, it was a a starship song starship that's it who is because of that movie who's that the song got worst started. so they they went from jefferson airplane yes to jefferson starship two great yeah, bands man. yes to absolutely starship and, yeah. and, and and that's when i stopped listening to it i i went to school with uh grace slick's daughter and uh wow. went to probably a few parties with her my mother Whoa. used to be grace slick's um off-road hairdresser and um so oh we God. both have this little connection um uh to jefferson starship or airplane and uh but i guess i can't complain about them because i know we built that city made a buttload of money so oh, I, know, totally. I, I guess yeah. i'm in the wrong but yeah that song yeah. was a huge hit i'm blanking on the name of it but uh, uh i know that they did the yeah, the ending song yeah that i i really even though they kind of went into that realm of like 80s pop. It was such a catchy, awesome tune. And it's like, to me, I just, every time I hear a song, now I think of Mannequin, but, um, but yeah, I know we got super off topic on that, but <laughs> I, had to, I had to mention it because yeah, it, Mannequin's a great movie, but no, I mean, it was, I guess, yeah, Mannequin 2 is the main inspiration for it, so. So now at the, <laughs> at the beginning though, and once again, I don't want to give too many spoilers away. Um, the, there, there's a killer and, but the killer's moving, walking around and stuff. It's not, it's not yeah. a, a mannequin. So is there kind of like a mannequin or mannequin two type of thing where it's a mannequin well, one moment and it was, then it's alive the next? It was supposed to be like, like I said, it was supposed to be a Halloween decoration, and in the in the actual film, like he's, it is like supposed to be a person walking around. It's not supposed to be like a mannequin, but um, the mannequin in the second part of the film, kind of um, or decoration, whatever anyone ever wants to kind of look at it, is kind of like sort of is the thing that sets people off a little unease that you know it might be an actual person dressed up or it's a mannequin, so. Yeah, if that if, does that make sense? I'm not sure. I feel, it does. I feel like it, it does, and and the costume is cool looking. It's it's a um, I like the look of the the mannequin slash killer. So, um, thank you. I'll show you. Welcome. And there's a that was little... me. Actually. Oh, you? Oh, really? <laughs> I was I played, I played the the walking oh, okay. the walking guy. Yeah. Once yeah. again, multitasking. Yes. <laughs> and there's a uh, a little girl at the beginning um how was it working with uh with the child uh, actress oh man so much fun um that was probably more, i mean no offense to the rest of the principal cast or shooting um <laughs> that was so much fun working with her um isabel um is uh a, is the daughter of one of my wife's friends and uh she was so cool. I mean, it was really just, she was, she wanted to like film scenes and get into it and like take the camera, but she was very like, like a child. She was very much like wanting to do other stuff. And um, we kind of had to just like, you know, 
make it like play like a game and or, or say hey just look over here and look over there and um don't look like you're scared or or you know and she had a very like for a little bit she had this blank expression that um i thought kind of, it just worked i mean she was not a a, a young little actress in the beginning but now i think she's uh a pro in my eyes definitely yeah she did a good job so um she really did uh, I mean, she looks surprised. She drops like the plate. It, it's just uh, yeah. most kids just overdo it. You know, <gasps> and then they you know, then she would yeah. drop the plate, but she didn't do that. She she felt very uh, very natural, and um, right. I thought that she yeah that she did a good job. So that's why I, I wanted to ask you because most people would say, oh my god, that kid's a horrible actress, and oh, oh. they were a nightmare to deal with, and the helicopter parent and. But uh, yeah, it's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was great. Her, her parent, her, her um. Her mom, um, Bev, um, she actually was in Hexercise um, as one of the cult members um, and, and near in the end of the film. So we had a great relationship with her. And I, I remember me and Brian, my um, my uh, AD and my DP, uh, we both were kind of like trying to figure out like need to get a kid to do this part. And we had to find someone with blonde hair um, to kind of match the character a little bit. So I remember... Bev's daughter having blonde hair and I called her up and her messenger and I said hey you know could we use Isabel and she said yeah and so there you go perfect and story and I noticed one thing you like sleazy bosses so bo both of the bosses in both these films are a little sleazy <laughs> it's a, they're, they're workplace horror movies let's put it that way I think that, <laughs> oh yeah. true yeah <laughs> yeah so it just, I don't know. I, I thought there was, um, I don't know. It just, to me, it's its funny to have a, like one sleazy character in a movie instead of everybody being sleazy. So, I mean, there's always that one, I guess, in 80s horror or horror sure. movies in general. Well, yeah, you so. got you got to have that guy that you want to see die, you know, or the horror <laughs> woman. I guess it could go both ways. The, totally. the, yeah. and, and going back to it's, it's the details is I noticed on his desk is a picture of himself. <laughs> yeah i don't know it wasn't me who came up with that idea i think um actually I, I think in the beginning no so there yeah in the beginning we i said let's put a picture of him on the desk i think that would be actually kind of funny because it just shows how self-centered he is right. and this beautiful kind of like internalization of his character and that's another thing without really getting too character detailed um and then you walk out into other parts of the um the building and there's more pictures of them hanging up yeah so, yeah there is there's one yeah. that's just i think it's when yeah. the the girl just got like hired or something like she walks out mm -hmm. and she's standing in like a doorway or one of them is standing yeah. in the doorway and there's the picture of him again yeah. <laughs> I think michelle michelle gibbs who played um kate uh michelle came up with that idea about hanging it in a different part and I'm, I'm like that's hilarious i'm doing it <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's great. Yeah, no, everybody in in the film, actually, everybody in both films were were really good, and um, especially with well, uh, exercise, you know, with the um, you know, with not having dialogue and having to express things like you said, like could be with their hands, gestures, it could be with their face or body, mm -hmm. you know. Now this one, you're dealing with dialogue, and yeah. and I thought everybody did a good job. And the one thing that I like about both films is there is no time wasted. You know, 18 minutes was fine for for the first film. This is 11 minutes. It's it's at no point did I go like, well, that scene wasn't needed, or well, that shot could have been trimmed. So yeah. you know, for when you're saying that, you know, you you don't really prefer to be a director and stuff. You you brought together two solid short films. So Thank you. Um, you know, Thank oh, you. and 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 since uh, Hexercise doesn't really have a home, why not put that on uh, Horror Tales instead, or maybe even have it on Part Three. I mean, that would be cool. I mean, I, it sort of already has its audience with with as it being established as a short film. But I mean, like, it's not a bad idea. I would honestly, I would, I would just rather do something different. Or, um, it's tough to say. I mean, like, where it stands, it's great. But um, it's John. It's not a bad idea, though. It really is. Or or a Brad Twig anthology, since he does a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. Brad Brad is super awesome with all the anthologies too. He would definitely be open for it, I'm sure. Yeah. So it's it, especially that it's finished. Less for him to do. Yeah. You know? That's true. That is true. It's not a bad idea at all. 
definitely something to consider i think about it and where was this film shot um at my home actually most of every, everything besides the very opening uh the opening was shot at at bev's home and then we shot the rest of the stuff here even the um the office scenes were shot um at my house by kind of hiding things and putting up whiteboard and uh just uh using some old techniques from uh sean video movies so yeah well the, the one thing what i like about hearing that is you can and and i am i am victim to this well no victim makes me sound like a victim i i am <laughs> i'm guilty i will say of this is you can always tell when you're shooting in the director's house and in this you could not because really you, yeah you. because you would awesome. well if it's a director's house you have posters there's a poster of halloween there's a poster of texas chainsaw massacre there's a poster of and a lot of the times they always have the it's like an actress that like the it's the actress's character's house okay i don't mm -hmm. know too many women that have texas chainsaw massacre posters up or you know slayer posters they're out there but it, it's oh, like not. this is obviously the more. director's house <laughs> And, yeah. and with yours, it just looked like a house. It just looked like somebody's house, which is nice. There is, so guiltily, there is one scene where there is a poster, but it happens so fast. Actually, two scenes. One where there could have been a poster, another one where there is a poster in the scene, but I'm not going to point them out. So, but <laughs> if, if, you, you, if you miss it, you miss it. There. Exactly. <laughs> and... Um, Let's see, what else do I have here? I got, uh, oh, so is there anything, now the version I saw of this is um, obviously going on to an anthology so you wouldn't have credits. Um, what other credits on there, like did you do? Is there, are there any credits that we need to, need to know about? Anybody special? Um, so we have, so we are running this to festivals and Brian Wadsworth, he did um, the credits for the festival versions that we're, we're sending out right now um all all with permission from phil herman and uh those guys so um but yeah we have we do have a version where there's actual like a small little like credit sequence at the end and a little title sequence at the beginning but um brian wadsworth um who is also a multitasker and who did so much i he did so much on this movie too and we we teamed up and like literally one of my favorite dudes to work with right now He's amazing, amazing guy. So, did you kind of like on the first film? Were you also like editor? You were a composer. You you did all that type of stuff too. Yeah, well, um, so I did the initial editing. Um, yeah, so most of the editing I did. I did all the editing again. Um, all the music, um, all the the directing. Um, he did he did the ad work. If I wasn't in the room, he would do a lot of the ad work um brian wadsworth brian wadsworth did the cinematography um yeah i didn't so so brian did a lot of the cleaning up of the image and and did like the 4k versions and the version that you see now on the dvd is what brian cleaned up and did and um i'll ask the same thing that i did with with exorcism um i'm not going to tell the ending to this but is there going to be a sequel or could there be a sequel open house said two you said the word hexorcism, which I almost feel like now we have a sequel name. Oh, no. He yeah. <laughs> I like it, though, man. <laughs> Exercise, um, not exorcism. But that does work, though. It, it does kind of <laughs> no, fall cool. into it, doesn't it? It does. Um, I, could, I, could, I could use that. Um, I think, you know what? Open House, I could do a sequel of that if we were asked to do it. That might be... So open house was a lot of fun to shoot. It was a lot less stressful than doing exercise. It was just, there was so much involved in exercise, a lot more people. We only had about like eight people um, at my house, which is actually very small. So, um, but working with that many people and, and everybody had such an open mind for this project and they were very cool, very laid back. Um, I, I can't, I, I couldn't ask for a better crew. Um, uh, actually had more people I knew on this project than I didn't. So it was a lot more comfortable to do to do this movie. And if we do a sequel, that would definitely be cool to do down the road. What we would do as far as sequel, I have no clue. No idea. But it would Open be cool. House 2, Hexorcism. 
next year <laughs> we'll just combine the universes like that yeah there you go awesome. that's that's a thing like, that people do now <laughs> no, they, do. they do man recurring characters absolutely and is there any other place where people can see open house or is it just right now on that uh, gonna come up on that dvd the anthology yes. dvd you can buy it the sleaze box um i think it's uh sleaze box the, the sleaze box.com um, or you can hit up Phil Herman, um, Chris, uh, Christopher Woods, those guys, they'll send you in the right direction to find it. Okay, good. All right, so that concludes our first half. And um, I'm not going to turn the page again. Sure. Now we're moving into soundtracks uh, that you have done. And this is your, your primary, I guess, bread and butter. Um, yes. And I'll show here the... So I went through and I did collect um, soundtracks and stuff that you have done. So... Okay. Uh, first would be Spirit Animal. I got to remember to always put it like here. Ooh, there that looks go. like a good soundtrack. It does, and it's it's a right. good soundtrack too. I really like it, which is why I bought it. And look at that, got there, look at that inside there. Look at that. <laughs> and <laughs> so that's a good one. And then the other CD I have from you is from... Uh, Milfs yes. and Zombies. That's another good one. Milfs versus <laughs> Zombies. And we got the back. Yeah, And man. inside there. Some little liner notes. Yeah. So it's a good looking that disc and everything. You know, it's, it's nice. And then okay. some things that I... So then here's the, the Spirit Animal. There you go. D. It's a beautiful... And beat. this is a uh, Madeline uh, uh, Deering, and then of course Mills vs. Zombies is Brad Twig. Uh, then we have also you worked on Bone Hill Road, and that's Top yep. Sheets. Oh. And awesome. then, and these are for Todd Sheets. Uh, these are actually the Indiegogo versions because I, I contributed to his films. Um, so here's oh, cool. Crown NATO. There you go. So we got that you worked on. Beautiful. Beautiful. You also worked on, uh, uh, we have uh, another MILFs for Zombies, but these are the the DVDs for them. Cool. The other one and, I don't recognize as much, but that's cool. The one on your uh, your right, I think it is? That one. No, not The other one. The other one. Yes, that one. I don't recognize that one. I guess that was before I, I worked on it. That's yeah, cool, though. I, I, um, I contributed twice. Uh, because I like the different covers, and oh, cool. um, he this one just has Brad's yeah signature on it. While this one has yeah. a bunch of cast and crew. That's cool. I like that one a lot too. I like them both, but I like the I love cartoon drawn covers. Yeah, his 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 covers are always good. He always has yeah. good covers. And yeah. then lastly is one that both you and I worked on with with Brad yeah. Floyd is is Fright Vision. So I I contributed yeah. like two films to that, and then you did you did the. Uh, the music for this what what music did you do on this one i, I did the opening and ending theme okay so yeah. it's yeah so it's got yeah so all of these are are good stuff to pick up and and i always recommend these oh yeah like this one is numbered so it's always uh -huh. good to support people and, and pick soundtracks up um so that's right. uh, yeah so these are so i figured we could and then there's a couple that i don't have but then you sent me links to them they are on bandcamp so people yep. can uh listen to them there or purchase them so the first one i thought would be mail order murder uh the story of wave productions and that this is a documentary is from 2020 um i this is one i definitely want to see um i like yeah. wave productions um yeah. i missed their campaign so I have no idea. Uh, I see that I can order it off of Amazon. So I'll probably right. pick up that. My first question is what is, la is it lapis? Lapsis. 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 What is lapsis? Yeah. Uh, it's just a name I picked, but it sounded cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, I know it's, it's such a, uh, it's a boring answer. I know. Um, but yeah, it was just a name I thought worked. Um, yeah okay and uh some of the people that are on this documentary um ron bonk jr bookwalter tina kraus so it's definitely one to check out and uh, yeah. 
there's uh, three tracks on this one. So there's Wave yeah. Grooves, Wave Groove 2, and then Main Theme, a.k.a. The Burn. Um, what can you tell me about these, these three tracks? So um, I guess the, go backwards a little bit. The Burn is, it kind of has a connection to Hexercise because the song... Um, the burn is actually in Hexercise as one of the very as, as basically the opening song that plays during the um, the credits in Hexercise, and also plays in the opening credits in Mills vs. Zombies. I'm, I'm sorry, not um, Mail Order Murder. Um, so um, originally, I wrote that was the very first song I ever wrote for. Um, it was the first song I had that was going to go into Hexercise originally. It was a video. Uh, I ma I made like a track and I put a video up on Facebook of this new song I was working on, and it was the burn. And Ross Snyder, one of the directors, um, came across it, and he really, really liked the song. That was basically how we kind of sort of met. And he was the person who asked me. He 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 asked me if he really likes the song. He would love to use it in the movie. Um, would I want to do? contributing music and or do the score for the film and and that's kind of where um th the very first song that kind of connected us to the movie so i still used it in exercise but it's it was really written for mail order murder um wave grooves was just kind of something i came up with um just kind of something you'd hear in the background almost sort of like uh yet again like that sort of um, instructional 80s kind of lax kind of sound um, you would hear like someone talking or doing instructional videos and um, the other song is kind of just um, just something I came up with a lot of this I wrote a lot of material and just kind of threw it at them and they kind of picked out what they thought sounded really good of course the burn did make the cut other songs didn't um, but um, yeah I so the movie is a, a, a talking head kind of film so a lot of it is just people talking and showing clips and it's a by all means an amazing documentary um so only about three of my songs actually went into the film but um it was still so awesome just to be um in that realm with these people who've created such a, such a phenomenon like wave that um you know regardless if it was just one song or two songs i would have been happy just to you know, just just being in the crowd with them is is great. Yeah, I I, I like the music and and I really want to watch the documentary. So oh, it's great. Um, watch it. Yeah, it's, awesome. it's I, I love documentaries, anyways, and especially when it deals with film, and especially if they're um, all about like low budget filmmaking or low budget companies, yeah. and and so yeah, that's definitely definitely have an interest in that. I'll be picking that up shortly. Yeah. So um, oh, now the. Sure. The other one that uh, that you sent me was Force to Fear, and that's uh, 2020. Uh, the soundtrack runs uh, roughly an hour, and it's 25 tracks. Um, it reminded me of, for some reason, and I have not seen this film in ages, so I don't even know if the music's similar. But when I was hearing it and maybe reading about what the film is about and everything, kind of like Savage Streets with Linda Blair. I don't know why that came to my mind. Wow. Like, oh, this kind of reminds me of Savage Streets. But yet, like I said, I don't know. The, 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 maybe there's no connection at all. That's just the film that came to mind. So tell me a little bit about well, uh, Force to Fear. Well, Force to Fear, definitely there is sort of a uh, Savage Streets vibe to it. I, I don't think it was a conscious um, thing on my part making the score for it like Savage Streets, but the initial film is very much like a women's revenge movie in a way. Um, uh, which is one of the first song, first songs in the movie is called Lethal Lipstick, which is kind of that right there, kind of hits right at that core of the theme in the movie. Um, I might be, um, uh, nothing here is right from Zane or Zane Hersper Hersberger or Chad's mouth. You know, they, they had their own way of doing the movie and they wanted, they wanted the soundtrack to be very, um, it just very 80s, very impactful and, yeah, I mean, Savage Streets definitely, I guess you could say, definitely looks at the sound of it. I looked at, like, so Zane would send me stuff like Avenging uh, Avenging Force. I think that was one soundtrack that um, 
I looked at, uh, I think the Canon film, is that Avenging Force? I think that's what it is, yeah. So that was one. Um, Deadly Prey, Steve McClintock's score for Deadly oh, yeah. Prey, which was a huge, a lot of the stuff you hear in the second part of the film is more kind of like Deadly Prey with like orchestral hits. And um, so I think what a lot of it is like, it's a very percussive score. So you hear a lot of like percussion sounds and, and actually that makes it feel more kind of like I could say, I could see like uh, the stuff in like um, Savage Streets for sure. Yeah, it's a um, it's a good sounding '80s soundtrack, and yeah. and, it, and it and it's one of those ones that does fit the film. Um, it's uh, it's one that I would like to have a you know get a physical copy of if you know if oh. one was ever available, and it's uh, you know added to the collection. So, uh, but it was a yeah. it's a good solid soundtrack. So I, I recommend people um, you know listen to that. Um, yes. Then. Um, I- you sent uh well this one i found i was just kind of doing some research but on Bandcamp there is also spirit animal yeah, so uh absolutely. that's yeah 16 tracks it's uh from 2019 it runs 47 minutes and that one which you know with uh, uh madeline deering i you know i really did focus a little bit on the soundtrack because i love the yeah. soundtrack to that film i really enjoyed the movie and I thought it was great. <coughs> Excuse me. So one one of the reasons why I wanted to, you know, definitely to have you on this, um, it kind of reminded me a little bit. And I'm only giving examples of these things, not saying that it it is this, sure. but just so people who are watching this have some sort of idea. Um, yeah. Kind of like Madman, that uh, slasher film, that Friday the Thirteenth ripoff, and Goblin. Huh? Kind of reminds me of Goblin. Okay, that's cool. I. I mean, that's yet like that is definitely something that I I don't think I really thought about Madman. Definitely didn't think about Madman. I don't think I thought about Goblin either. But I, I like I said, I love these I love these interpretations. Um, a lot of it came from just like oh, man. Someone actually told me that it sounded like film 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 rage movies like like Metamorphosis or um, what is it? Uh, I can't think of the one the ones that i like troll to like those kind of movies like the okay. sort of sound um i can't More even think of it like italian type like like italian so i guess you could say like if you're thinking like the goblin sense i guess i could totally see why people would say it sounds like more like a like a goblinish kind of score and um a lot of it was like i think before i i did the score for spirit animal i watched like tales from the quad dead zone and that was kind of like weirdly um, the main, ins- the one of the main films uh, that inspired me to do it, which is crazy as it sounds, but yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's one that I definitely, um, you know, and it, and it is one that you can get uh, along with, uh, you know, Mills for Zombies, like I've already shown, you know, you can get physical copies of these too, um, which then leads me into uh, milfs vs zombies um that is uh it's 28 tracks 2015 um according to imdb it's listed first as far as soundtracks go and that one reminded me of shade that one was kind of like all over for me um yeah there was some carpenter stuff in there kind of reminded me of ghost of mars or maybe in the mouth of madness i kind of got cool. some terminator out of it there was a little bit of lounge music and uh so how did that come about? What, what were your inspirations for that? Oh man, so much. So a lot of a lot of what I do with with scoring, I do a lot of collaborative talks with directors, and um, they'll give me suggestions, things they like to do. Like Spirit Animal, me and Maddie talked about doing tribal stuff in the background with some of the stuff, and I put that in there. Zane Hirschberger talked to me about doing a lot of '80s stuff, like Avenging Force kind of stuff like that. But with um, with most versus zombies, Brad had he he did want I think a, a more, I think we were, we talked about different things. I know I maybe I was a little more dominant in talking about the things that might work. Like I said, like there's some stuff like I I remember like um, redneck zombies was kind of something I heard. Like they're like the orchestral hits from like redneck zombies. You hear one like the 
zombies are killing people and the main theme for that kind of made me think of that inspired what was in most versus zombies um the lounge stuff just kind of like it, it's whatever kind of went with the scene and i felt the movie kind of had like it, an all over the place kind of atmosphere anyway so it just i think just the, the lounge stuff just kind of came to me from <laughs> you know stuff i used to watch and yeah um the very opening there's like a church um commercial like a like an evangelist kind of thing and um, a lot of that was new for me. Like I never knew how to do any of that stuff. And it was just me doing research, watching YouTube videos on it, just kind of like playing it back in my mind. So um, it was just, I guess, inspirationally, just um, it, it, like everything, like in between conversations, like Brad wanted me to do like a Mexican um, kind of sounding soundtrack for one of the TV shows, one of the girls were watching. And so I did something like kind of like a Mexican uh, song sting in in a part of the film. So it came from everywhere, man. It's it's such an eclectic film. Was it your your first soundtrack or is it just the first one that's listed on IMDb? Uh, it was no. So so most versus zombies, it had another score to it. Um, and Brad re-released it with a new score. So the, the date is correct on the film uh, being made, but when I came into it, it was um, I, 2020. So, no, it was not the first score I did. Oh, 20, oh 2020? Last year? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, either 20, like late 2019, early 2020. Yeah, because he re-released it with a new score. So he asked me to do the new score for it. Um, I, I still don't know why. I mean, I've never seen the original score of it, but... Uh, I mean, yeah, he, he wrote to me and uh, actually I wrote to him asking like, hey, maybe if you ever need any score work, let me know. And he let me know. So yeah. would, so is, because I haven't watched these in a while. I watched them when I originally got them. So would, would these be the original score or would these be the ones that you're on? So the one in the front probably has the very original score on it. The one behind I have, it. I have to see where my hand is here because I always go backwards. Oh, no, that, so the that one, have, one there is yeah, the very original score on it. Um, I think it was done by two different people, and that's the one right there with the one you're holding right now. It's the one I did. Oh, yeah. okay. Because I never... Yeah. Um, I actually never asked him why he asked me to do the score since it was already out with a, a score already. But, I mean, I, I, I've seen directors do that. You know, they take movies and put different scores on it. So, um, it was just, you know, in a fun little movie I wanted to score and it looked great so yeah I, I, I wonder if because this says yeah music by Michael Trapp two P's and so does the okay. other one so I wonder because one of these were released from um, Wild Eye right I think um, I think the yeah I, I don't know if they're if they are or going to be because the one you have right there uh the one behind that one, that might, yes, that one might be the uh, the one they were selling on the website. I don't think that's Wild Eye. Does it say Wild Eye on it? Because I can't. No, can't this is still one of his. Uh, yeah. One of the ones that was from the. Uh, uh, I think he did the initial Indiegogo, and then he did like a yeah. follow up one, and yeah. and so I I ordered it again because I liked the the art on this yeah. one yeah, and really cool. so i think the ones i have are the original soundtracks then so i'll have to pick up what's ever new like whatever new i'll have to look on like amazon or something i mean so I, I, yeah and then this is your soundtrack to it that is so correct. That is okay well that's interesting. I, I, I never knew that because I saw these when they originally came out. I have not watched them in years. So I just assumed okay. this and, and this, whoop, there we go, were the same yeah. thing. Yeah, no, it's two different soundtracks from what I understand. Yeah, because I, yeah, it's weird um, how it does go on, on IMDb is saying my first, but no, it was like the fourth, I think, maybe. Not okay. Sure. So it's probably just he put it down there for when the film came out because on the back of it here it says 2015. 
and on IMDb yeah. it says 2015 for you. So you yeah, must just I, be going yeah. off of yeah the algorithm or whatever, whatever you call it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, okay. So that that's what I'll have to add to my list to to purchase them. For um, sure. So then on top of that, um, you also did uh, for 1031. Uh, the Halloween anthology, um, yeah. Trespassers. You did the music for for that segment. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. So that was the first film. Uh, that was the first score to picture movie I've ever done. Like with um, Bone Hill Road was my very first one. That was I was more of a music contributor. Um, a lot of my music was used in the movie, but I never watched the movie to score it. Um, Trespassers was the first movie I actually watched um, and did the major um, well you know what that actually might not be true I did do one I did do a couple short films that aren't even named on IMDB from a student filmmaker but those movies are just like I don't even know where the hell they are um, but for for the most part like a movie that was available out there for people to see majorly that was the first one I did 1031. Um, Zane hit me up. Um, he was another filmmaker I approached because um, I was a big fan of The Barn and um, I know he did the cinematography for it. And uh, I told him like, I loved your movie and, and you know, Justin did a great job and like, I would love to work for you guys someday. And um, initially I thought like we, you know, me, him, Justin would do something, but Zane hit me up about this anthology um, and asked me to, to score it and yeah so it was my first major major gig doing something score for scoring a picture oh okay yeah cool and that got yeah. that got a good release so people yeah. definitely definitely heard it yeah it's an awesome anthology and it was it was really it was tough to do because of like with every score I'm very self-conscious and I'll constantly look at everything and um, try not to do, you know, too much thinking, but I, it's my plight as every artist, you just overthink <laughs> everything. So, yeah, I mean, it was a lot of fun to do. It was a great experience. It actually really got me understanding the, the techniques of um, the language relating to the score, to film the score and everything. So yeah. Um, awesome, awesome anthology, awesome segment. Yeah. Cool. And then one that's coming soon is Beyond Dark Dreams. What about that one? Yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah, so it, it is sort of kind of out. You'd have to hit up um, Joe Ruscio, who uh, the mastermind um, effects artist um, and assistant director for Spirit Animal. Um, Maddie and him are maybe one of my favorite film teams. Um, I mean, everybody I know works, like, works their asses off. They just had this incredible chemistry together, but yeah, um, hit up Joe if you want to find it. Um, but as far as the score, um, that was so much fun to do. Um, it was very, it, it took a lot of a lot of time to to work out the idea, but that was a lot more of like a Goblin um, meets Wendy Carlos kind of score. Yeah, it has that type of title. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean it. I I, I, I actually watched it recently and just because I was curious to see what the initial end result looked like. And man, it is, it's definitely very, I'm not even sure, maybe groundbreaking for, for its style. I mean, he really kind of did something that really just goes over people's heads as far as like, how the hell did he do that? And, but no, um, it was so much fun to work, work on and, I collaborated with um, Joe as far as like what he wanted. Um, he spoke a lot about Goblin and um, it was actually really hard for me to do that kind of stuff. I wasn't used to doing a lot of like the technical stuff that Goblin does. I don't think it even meets kind of close to it, but there is that sort of sparkle in it that definitely makes you think of like Goblin and, um, and like the shining was a very big inspiration for one segment. So each segment um, kind of had its own kind of vibe to it, but um, there was a little bit of Goblin in each kind of vibe, I think. Yeah, yeah I mean, they're, a they're, they're good to reference, you know, they're, they're, oh, uh, and they've done so many 
just as Goblin and Solo. You know, they've done so much work out there. Yeah, that, that it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, like when you ask about inspirations, like it's funny because Goblin doesn't really seem to come up as a huge inspiration for what I do, but um, they like kind of paved the way for a lot of horror films and horror composers to kind of like with that kind of style. And I think like you know, more I listen to them, the more I go, oh, I love that. I would love to replicate that or try and do something similar. So, um, like, yeah, there's such a they're such a deep dive kind of band just to get into like they're incredible yeah one film i i would say that deals with them of course dawn of the dead the original that that's yeah. a film where the music is you know it's the uh you know original goblin music but then yeah. romero also used all of those kind of like canned tracks that right. anybody could use and and that's a film where i could see people maybe saying well that doesn't match that why is that in a zombie movie you know <laughs> um and, right. and and it's true because there, there's a lot of kind of uh i don't elevator ish type music in it there's a lot of right. i mean it's but it works perfectly like everything together just works perfectly in that as far as like the soundtrack right. goes yeah i mean like they were victim to a lot of like soundtrack trading or like they a lot of their music ended up in other films that like i can't remember i'm not sure if it was like pieces or i think um, yeah I, I i really feel like they they've been like chopped up into other films like i've seen films me and my wife will, will watch a movie and be like oh wasn't that in what's it called like i think it was um I can't remember if it was like man, even though man, I can't remember if it was Fulci or oh man, like I don't even remember, but like their, their music has been spliced into so many different films. Yeah, like I was seeing if I had it right here, but I, I don't, um, it must be in a different stack, but uh, hell of the living dead, you know, the dawn of the dead ripoff is did they all do that one? goblin music oh. that's taken from basically dawn of the dead. Like, the, like the, almost the whole soundtrack yeah. is is Goblin, but taken from also, yeah. various films that they did music from, but mostly Dawn of the Dead. And you know what? I'm thinking of, too, also um, Fabio Frizi. A lot of his music was, like, trade-in films, too. So I think a lot right. of Italian films have all these, like, music jumping into different films, like Manhattan Baby. There were so many music, songs in Manhattan Baby that were also in other um, Goblin, or not other, like, Fabio uh, Frizi kind of scores. Um, it's the same with Goblin. They were all victim to this, but like, I mean, it was Italy. They did things so quick, and things were out there. And but, um, yeah, I mean, like Hell of the Living Dead. I actually didn't remember them doing that. Um, wait, is that also what's the, there's an AKA name for that too? It's right? a Night of the Zombies. Is the is Night the American the title? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I had the vest run of that on on tape. L I love that one. That is an it's, amazing. It's my favorite, underrated. like zombie ripoff. I don't, I don't include yeah. like the original zombie as a ripoff. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But but Hell of the Living Dead or, or Night of the Zombies is by far my favorite zombie ripoff or Dawn of yeah. the Dead ripoff. And, and not yeah. too long ago, they they I don't I think it's probably a bootleg. Um, somebody probably just took the the tracks from different movies and made a yeah. soundtrack for Hell of the Living Dead. And uh, I was so excited to get that, even though I have all that music anyways. It's yeah. like, great, now there's an actual soundtrack to it. Because all, yeah. all that Dawn of the Dead stuff is at the very beginning of Hell of the Living Dead with the SWAT guys. Right, right. And then, you know, because right. they're going yeah. into that building, which is just like, wait a minute, this is just Dawn of the Dead. Yes, that the, like orchestral like voice. The, oh, yeah, that's of, all in there. Yeah, yeah. 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 So the, I, I really... And that's the thing, like, as we said, like Italian films were, they were made so quickly and a lot of them just need to get them out and made. And the whole ripoff culture in Italy is just so fascinating. Um, <laughs> I just watched, I just watched Cruel Jaws actually last night. Ah. And <laughs> like, just like looking at these movies, I'm like, I don't care if they rip off like Mary Poppins, they're just going to do it like a little bit crazier and maybe better than we do it. So well, speaking of cruel jaws, this is my favorite Italian jaws ripoff. Okay. 
And I was so I, happy to actually find a copy of this because this it's still <laughs> Spielberg would not allow it to, to be released. So this is, and people have asked me when I showed it on, on Facebook, they're like, no, they're like, this can't be the real copy. And it's like, it, it is, it's, I'm telling you, everything <laughs> on this is official. This is, I don't, I don't know how it got by, oh. but it's, it's great. And, and of course it's got, you know, the footage from Cruel Jaws is, is it's taken oh, from this. Man. All, a lot of these uh, Italian shark ripoffs take their footage yeah. from this movie. So th oh, this man. is, this is a great one. And there's a, there's two soundtracks available for this. Um, I can't find the other one. That's a longer one, but I did find the a shorter version of it. Uh, there is one I, that's just the last shark, and then there's one that's great white. That's awesome. I don't even know if I is that um is that a different title for Cruel, Cruel Jaws or is that just like no they uh, took a, they took footage from this and put it into Cruel Jaws. But this oh was originally God. when it came to America called Great White what? with this or, poster okay. and. Uh, uh, and it's just it's it, it literally is Jaws. I mean, they've got a Quint character. Oh my God! That's a Vic Morrow. You know, sadly, you know, he died wow. tragically. Holy. And uh, they even have a ship that's uh, like a boat that's similar to the Orca. Oh and it, it's everything is. And Spielberg just said, "No, this is this is way too this is way too close." Yes. So it he sued him, and they, and it has not been technically available. That's awesome. Yeah, he even That's took like a big ad out in the paper that said, do not see this movie because it, it rips off Jaws so much. But it's very, <laughs> there's like so, like songs in it. There's a score in it. It's it's a good soundtrack. I wish I could find the uh, the longer version, but it's, it's difficult. I think you can find uh, a lot of the music on YouTube. Um, I'm not sure if it's under Last Shark or, or, or Great White, but... Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but back to you, back to, back to you um no. two other films of course todd sheets um so we have also uh you know we got the the clown clown nato nato and then okay. we got bone hill road so we got clowns werewolf um yeah. so so tell me about uh, uh, uh bone hill road first what was that now, they make, now they should make a clown werewolf movie you think that would Ooh. work a, a clown Ooh. that's that's like wandering around at the at the circus and he gets bitten by a wolf oh my god it sounds awesome yeah there we let's, go let's do that i let's like it together, man. <laughs> Actually, really like um so yeah uh i want to clarify something real quick with um i hope the lighting is okay i know it's getting dark over here um so clown nato um there's a misconception on that i i did the music I did a lot of music for Clown Nato. Not a lot of it made it to the film. Um, you will see my name on it, but uh, it was a very similar situation with um, Bone Hill Road. But Bone Hill Road, in that, I, there was a lot more of my music used in it um, with uh, Justin Burning and, and Toshi and uh, a couple other composers. And what Todd does is he'll gather up different artists. They'll make they'll he'll ask him to make music for his movie he'll collect them and he'll put them in so um yeah for both of those movies they were pretty much me just kind of making songs and just giving them to todd and he kind of took them and put them in there so um and like i said that was that that was my first bone hill road was my very first just you know that's how i think of it so um doing that um todd talked a lot about like a lot of synth wave, dark wave tracks. And he threw a bunch of YouTube videos to me. And after that, it was just kind of like me making a bunch of songs and he took them whenever he liked, very similar to um, Mail Order Murder, like whatever they liked, they just kind of, he or they took it and they used it. So would you give yeah. him like five songs and then he picked three, that type of thing? Um, I gave him like for Bone Hill, I gave him almost 20 songs. Oh, 20 wow. Tracks yeah and he used a lot um clown nato i probably did maybe close to 16 um 15 something like that but no actually um on the soundtrack it says like something like all songs written by so and so if not by matt cannon um i did not write a lot of the songs on that soundtrack that came with the dvd 
I just want to clarify that. I Todd is an amazing yeah. director, but yeah. Yeah, I yeah. forgot that was in there. Yeah. Yeah, there are I've done I think there might have been like three songs that I made that made it into the movie. Um and Todd has such a huge workload, it's no surprise to me that he might have thought that some of the other artists were actually me. So um it's totally fine. Um great movie, awesome movie. Um there was just a little bit of miscommunication when it came to getting that soundtrack um, made. And I feel kind of guilty because I don't deserve most of the credit for that. Other people do. But um, I would say, yeah. Yeah. But it's a cool looking soundtrack, though, man. That was yeah, awesome. the, the, it looks like a vinyl. Yeah, yeah the, he does cool. state on the back, um, all tracks by Matt Cannon, unless noted with like an asterisk or two asterisks. Yeah, so. and there's a lot on there that I I unfortunately did not do and um uh Fatal Caller he actually used a lot of my music that was I think I still haven't seen Fatal Caller which is a movie he just put out um but apparently used music that I gave him for Clown Nato for Fatal Caller which I haven't seen so I can't say that's necessarily true or not so okay and yeah. um, just the last, last couple questions and I'll let you go because sure. you're sure. you're getting pretty dark over there. So I, I, you I am, I know, I, I should turn a light on, but I know we're almost done. So, um, so do you, um, when somebody doesn't use your music, like, like let's say for like Clown Nado or, or, you know, the other stuff, do you then kind of put that out to other films? Like, oh, well, Todd didn't use this, I'll use this for, you, you know, for brad um no no I, I try not to i feel like if i write something for a film it's just going to be for that movie um i've used music from stuff he didn't like that todd didn't use for like maybe a lapsus release on its own like there's a couple of songs i might have used on like my one of my band camp pages as just like a standalone track but for all I know, he could have used it in another movie that I don't know about. But um, yeah, I mean, I've never used it for any other movies. Like I've never taken a song that was used for like Clown Nato or Bone Hill Road that never made it and gave it to somebody else. I feel like you have to write a song for the film. Um, and that's just how I feel with that. And um, who decides on the soundtracks that are brought out? So I, I have two physical copies here, but I have multiple mm -hmm. movies. Do you, do you decide, or is that the director? Like the like the physical copies that you have, like when they're released. Yeah, like like is it okay? Like are they like is Todd okay? Is 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 Brad okay yeah. with you releasing their you know these soundtracks? Yeah. Mo like like so it wasn't pulled into a lot of contracts for these movies and i've always went to the filmmaker and asked hey is there already if i release this um and like so mills versus zombies brad um wanted to put a soundtrack out for it so he's the one to put that out um and uh i actually did the physical uh whole cover art for the spirit animal soundtrack you have there everything from the cover inside to the back all that i've yep everything I, I designed took stuff from the movie kind of put it in there that was all me for doing that and so long story short i always go to the director before i do any of this stuff so most of the time they're usually a-okay with it and where you know because we i mentioned Bandcamp. i think i got a uh, spirit animal from kanaki was yeah can you also get yeah. milfs versus zombies through kanaki you, you can. Um, I think you can probably, if you, if you contact Brad, um, he can send you in the right direction. I don't even know where you find the soundtrack anymore for it, but um, I think it should still be up there on the site where you get um, actual no spurts of zombies from. Okay. So um, unless it's going to Wild Eye, but um, for the most part, you can hit Brad Twig up. I'm sure he would know exactly where to go. Okay. And um, last question is... Uh, sure. Um, is there anything you would like to promote? Uh, it could be past, present, future. Um, anything at all that you want people to know about? And also, where can they, you know, get your work? Um, well, I guess the newer film would be um, Beyond Dark Dreams. Definitely go check that out. That just dropped uh, with Joseph Ruscio. So if you want copies of that, definitely hit him up. Um, 
yeah, if you want to find my music, I'm on Bandcamp at lapsus666.bandcamp.com. I have other tracks besides actual scores on there. Um, you can look me up on Instagram. My handle is Matt Lapsus Cannon. Um, anyone ever needs score work, they could always message me. And um, super reasonable, you know, with working with anybody, you know, just hit me up. Let's chat. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, unless there's anything else, then I'm I'm gonna let you go before you kind of fade okay. into darkness. Um, yeah. Yeah. There, there's an upcoming yeah. film title for you: Fade into Darkness. Fade into uh, darkness. <laughs> so, um, cool. all right. Well, thank you very much for for being on on one filmmaker, one film, or in your case, one uh, one composer, uh, many soundtracks. Soundtracks. Um, and also one film, one uh, two films, uh, one filmmaker, yeah. two films. So uh, two, um, two films, many soundtracks. <laughs> yes, there we go. <laughs> I'll, I'll get that title correct b- b- before it goes up. And <laughs> uh, I'll put a whole bunch of links down below. Uh, this will be okay. up uh, this coming Wednesday. Um, so make sure everybody to take a look at this. And I guess that's it. So thank you all. And uh, until the next one, I will see you later. Where's my hand? There we go. Bye. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome.